Second uh, Chronicles 29 takes us to Hezekiah. We are up to the good King Hezekiah. We began him the study of Hezekiah last time. And uh, young man took over uh, the uh, full reign as king at the age of 25, after having spent a few years co-reigning with his wonderful father. And you will remember that we are approaching, as you start with Hezekiah, we're about six years away from an earthquake, political, military occurrence in the northern kingdom. If I could get the map, the big Assyria map up. And this is the one we looked at last time, and all these funny arrows and everything here. This is, in the light yellow here, is basically, at that time, the kingdom of Assyria before its greater expansion. And in about six years, Hezekiah is going to watch all of the northern kingdom from actually go down here, and they're going to be taken out. And the second time, they go this way, but they are moved the whole nation out, and the, of course the, the political way to handle these things, the reason they're deported, besides God telling them that's what was going to happen, is that is how you control your conquered lands, is to take all the, the leadership, all the important people, and the only ones you leave behind are those, I feel like I'm in a tube. <laughs> It's like a little kid when you hollered in the culvert to listen to your voice be funny. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So they are they're in this situation where uh, where they're going to be packed off in order to uh, keep the local folks. The only ones you leave are the ones that don't matter. Anybody that matters has influence, has anything like that. You gather them up and you pack them out and you spread them all over your kingdom. One, it gives you bright people scattered throughout your kingdom who are now dependent on you. And so hopefully we'll integrate into your system and strengthen your nation, and it weakens uh, the possibility of resistance in the homeland. And so you put all your folks you already have and put them out in that new territory. They are now dependent on you for support because they're still linked there, plus they need the support, and they're more likely to stay with you than to rebel against you. So it was a big political military plan that the Assyrians were very effective at using. And God used that to uh, bring judgment upon the northern kingdom. So that's coming up north as Hezekiah takes over. And uh, if you want to pop up the city of Jerusalem just for fun, here is a scale model of the city of Jerusalem. And it's a little bit hard to see maybe, but here is the old city right here is the Kidron Valley here. And this over here is going to be added on. That's the new subdivision that Hezekiah will put in during his reign. Yeah. Where's the palace? The palace would be, uh, here's the uh, temple, and the palace would be across over here. And this is that Hieropoeum Valley right here that ends up, right, if you go there today, it's all kind of filled in. It's a big landfill. There used to be a bridge across over to here. And so in the old city, and the city of David is down here. The old original city is down here. What kind of acreage are we talking about? You know, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I can answer that. I have never thought about that, how big an area that is. How long would it take to the How long would it take to the you know? With GPS, I think we could get over in about a couple days. But without and two mules, we'd be there a month or so. There's a lot of rocks there. There's a lot of rocks there. Okay, those of you who have been there know there's a reason they call that the Dome of the Rock. Okay. So, and there's a reason they chose that with a lot of rocks because as a city, you're not trying to produce food and all that. You want a secure place. And you can see the old city here with its walls up on this hill, so you have to come up at it from any direction. That was the, the logic behind that. It's a very secure city. And remember when David first took it, it was thought to be impregnable, that no one could get in. 
and they went in through the waterway. There's a the spring of Gihon is right. I want to say it's out here. I can't spot it on that. There's that spring that fed the city, and uh, we last time looked at Hezekiah's tunnel. I didn't have you pop it up this time, but it goes across the city to the pool of Siloam down here and pulls water to secure the water in case of a siege, which Hezekiah knew was going to need. Isn't the temple going to be built on 1,500 square miles of feet or something there? Yeah, uh, oh, you're thinking of the Revelation where it talks about so many miles square and wide and high. And I'm not sure if that's related. I don't think that's related to the actual physical dimensions of the existing Jerusalem. But, but it's, but yeah, but that is one description of the size of it, revelation of the new Jerusalem. Yeah. But I, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to find that out. I imagine there's a couple of miles across there anyway. So it's not huge by our standards. Of course, the city now is way spread out. It, it's kind of the same thing as uh, all the cities you know around where uh, Seattle used to be one little town and Everett was another little town and now if you don't know where you're at the whole thing all blends into one great big mess. So Jerusalem's similar in that there's a whole lot from together. Anyway, so here's the city and Hezekiah of course adds this portion during his and the tunnel and all this other stuff uh, that he's done. So he's a brilliant guy. He, he knows how to run things. He knows how to do stuff, get things done. He's got some incredibly sharp people working for him. But the uh, most important thing about Hezekiah is what we find in Chronicles as it begins. And that's what I really wanted to focus on this morning. And because uh, the other crisis that Hezekiah inherits from his father is described for us, and we read it last time, but I want to go back through it because I want you to at least read through it so it's in your mind, just this huge, overwhelming mess that Hezekiah inherits from his father. So here's the situation as he uh, comes into the kingdom and in the beginning of chapter 29. So let's just read from the beginning, and I'll read down through there. And you can uh, see what kind of a mess they've got. So Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. And then he said to them, Listen to me, O Levites. Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry the uncleanness out from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and have turned their backs. They have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and minister to him and to be his ministers and burn incense. And he's referring back to the very end of Leviticus. And I might just see if I can jump back to real quick and just take you to the last... says, but if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, 
if instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, and fever that shall waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away also. You shall sow your seeds uselessly, for your enemies shall eat it up. And I will set my face against you, so you shall be struck down before your enemies, and those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when no one is pursuing you. If after all these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will also break down your pride of power. I will make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent uselessly, for your land shall not yield its produce, and the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. If you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague over you seven times according to your sins. And I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, and you shall, and which shall bereave you of your children, destroy your cattle, and reduce your numbers so that your roads lie deserted. And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. And I also bring upon you a sword, which will execute vengeance in you before the covenant. And when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you, so you shall be delivered into enemy hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, and then will bring back your bread <coughs> and fish in the mouth, so you will eat and not be satisfied. And it goes on and on and on, describing exactly the mess that they're in. So there it is. He's already told them that's what will happen. And so here they are. And I want you to try to get in your mind, if you can see this as real, as the king gathers these guys in the court, to put in your mind, when they gather, they, they gather in the outer court of this thing here. They're not going to be in the inner court. In the outer court, where the brazen altar is supposed to be, and the brazen altar where you offer all the sacrifices is supposed to be right in front here. And it's now moved off to the side. And you'll remember there's another altar been erected there that the uh, king before him had decided looked really cool when he was up in Damascus. And he sent the directions down and they built it and they put it there. But even it doesn't have a fire in it anymore. So as you come here, this, these doors are closed right here. There's nothing going on inside. The, the incense has ceased to burn on the incense altar. It's filled with junk, if you will, clutter. It's become a storehouse. Probably got lots of uh, idol worship type items stashed in there as well, which made it unclean. There's not been anybody into the Holy of Holies in some time. Nobody's gone in there and sprinkled the blood annually in front of to cover the sins of the nation. The whole thing's deserted. The cobwebs are hanging. It's dusty. And I can just see, in my mind, maybe it's because I come from Bickleton, I can see the uh, tumbleweeds rolling through the, <laughs> through the courtyard as they stand out there and the wind whistles through and there's nothing happening. The fire's gone out. The fire that's supposed to be kept burning continually on that brazen altar to take the sacrifices of the nation is out. And the altar shoved off to one side. And the whole thing's just heartbreakingly desolate as Hezekiah meets with these guys. So here's the picture. This is the, the catastrophe that he has to deal with. And so he assembles everyone and they go in and they cleanse out uh, the temple, and then they begin the, the sacrifices. And uh, maybe we'll just go read through that, and then we're going to take time. I even got a handy day in the handout for you. I want to take you back to Leviticus because you have to understand what it is they reinstituted. When they come back in and they do these sacrifices, and we talk about it, and you go, oh, yeah, I really did that, that kind of stuff. So we're going to spend a little time this morning going back over what were those sacrifices, why are they important, and what do they do for us today. So let's just read the last of this as quickly as I can here to kind of get you through all those names I can't pronounce. So um, 
he says, uh, we're going to go and straighten things up. Verse 12. And so the Levites arose, and we got Mahath, the son of Amasai, the Joel, the son of Azariah, from the sons of the Kohathites, and from the sons of Merari, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jahaliel, and from the Gershonites, jo Joah, the son of Zimah, and Eden, the son of Joah, and from the sons of Eliza, Phan, Simri, and Jael, and from the sons of Asaph, and Zechariah, and Mataniah, and the sons of Heman, and Jehiel, and Shimei, and the sons of Jehuth, and Shemai, and Uziel, and you go, my gosh, I slaughtered those terribly, I know, I'm sure I had to. And Hebrew sounds nothing like English, so. One thing you want to notice is, what an honor to have your name recorded and learned in the Book of Life, isn't it? These guys were God's guys that stood in the gap, that called in and it's disaster. And they're all relatives of, of the Levi, of Levi, you know, the Levites and, uh, and Aaron the priest and all that. So that the ones, if you can read, if you recognize Asaph, the sons of Asaph, that's, he wrote a number of the Psalms. He was the musical guy. He was the music worship leader, if you will. So we've got him in there. And uh, so we've got all these guys that have descended from those who went before, and those are important guys. I wish I was smart enough to show you how a whole bunch about each one, but if you notice, God recorded them on purpose so that we might remember their faithfulness. And they assembled their brothers and consecrated themselves and went in to cleanse the house of the Lord according to the commandments of the king by the words of the Lord. So the priests went into the inner part of the house which the Levites couldn't do, only the priests could go in there, and to cleanse it of every unclean thing which they found in the temple of the Lord. And they brought out into the court of the house of the Lord, and the Le brought it out into the court, and the Levites loaded in their pickup truck, I think it says there, received it to carry out to the Kidron Valley. So they packed it off out of the court. Oh, wow, you are good. Thank you. So there's... there's and they brought it out into here, and they loaded it up, and they hauled it off into the Kidron, which is over here. So uh, there we have it. There, here's the temple and the other courts where the Levites could have helped out in the court of the public out here. So they are cleaning house big time, packing that stuff out. And so they got it all. This is... It, they started on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month, they entered the porch of the Lord. So it took them eight days to clean the outside, and then they consecrated the house of the Lord in eight days. So it took 16 days. It took eight days to clean out the inside, eight days to clean out the outside. It's a big project. Half a month hauling and cleaning, plus they had to replace everything that was lost or given away. It says, we have cleansed the whole house of the Lord, verse 18, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, the table of showbread with all its utensils, over all the utensils which King Ahaz had discarded during his reign in his unfaithfulness, we have prepared and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. And so then, in verse 20, King Hezekiah arose early and assembled the princes of the city. And they went up to the house of the Lord. So all the leaders came up and gathered them up. And they brought in seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, the sanctuary of Judah. And he ordered the priests and the sons of Aaron to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So let's pause there for a moment and go, what in the world just happened? <coughs> And um, got a whole bunch of these, so I'll let you pass them around with back. A few more over here, and hopefully they'll circulate around. So, and uh, Jeff, if you pop up the little chart for me, what you're getting is a copy of this uh, document plus some explanatory stuff. Um, to give you a little bit of a handle, this is one guy's thing I have borrowed from Mr. R.K. Campbell. And there's lots of different kind of angles on this thing, but it 
outlines for you the seven major offerings uh, that are in the book of Leviticus in those first seven chapters. And hopefully, this will give you a little bit of a handle on what's just taking place. And as you look at the listing, is interesting in, uh, in Leviticus, because as it lists them off, it starts with, you can see the numbers on those. If you look on that chart, you see number one, number two is in the middle, number three is over on this side, and then four and five down here, which is kind of an interesting arrangement he puts it. But as they're listed for you in Leviticus, they're listed from God's perspective down to us, if you will. And when we approach God, and when they approach God in the, in the tabernacle or the temple, either one, they started from number five and worked their way back up. And that will make more sense, I think, as we go through these. But it says here that he rose early and they went in, they brought in all these rams and bulls and they did them for a sin offering. And the sin offering is number four right there. And, and then they will proceed up the line to the others. But let's just take these from one down to five as we look at them from God's perspective and kind of review what they are. The first one that he lists there in Leviticus is this burnt offering. And we read about the burnt offering all the time. What in the world was the burnt offering and what did it mean? Well, the elements in the burnt offering were several depending on your wealth. They could be a bull, a ram, or a, a dove or a young pigeon, working your way down, and uh, for those that were poor. And this offering is completely burned and consumed on the altar. And so the purpose of this, it's a voluntary act of worship. It is uh, an, an atonement in a way for unintentional sin in general, but it's really an expression of devotion and commitment to God. And so what you see there is that it it's always has to be a male. It's always uh, all sacrificed on the altar. The only thing that isn't is that the animal is skinned and the priests were allowed to sell that hide. And I never have figured out exactly what the symbolic part of that is. And nobody, they always, That's one of those that just drives you crazy. They pass that over. Somebody somewhere must evaluate that, but most of them don't. And this, uh, as you can see, here is God glorified up here. This is a picture of what Christ had done on the cross. And that's why it's connected here to this. This is uh, Jesus Christ not in his position as sin bearer for us necessarily, but it is the fact that he had wholly committed himself to do the Father's will. As an act of obedience and an act of to, of following the Father's will, he sacrificed, he was completely wholly sacrificed and given to God. So in that you see uh, Christ illustrated that, uh, that this worship, this praise was to go to God only. The, the next one, then in the series that they go through, is the one called the meal offering or the grain offering, which is an interesting one. It is not anything to do with any animals, and there is no blood involved or anything like that. It is grain or fine flour, and it is always mixed with olive oil and salt. So we have, and it's either in cakes or wafers or sometimes just as grain, and it was mentioned very specifically that there shall be no yeast and there shall be no honey go with that. And sometimes it is also offered with a drink offering, which was a, a libation of wine that's poured out along with it. This one is also a voluntary act of worship, and it's recognition of God's goodness and provision and some devotion to God, but it also speaks of the bread of life. We also see that on the table of showbread, the unleavened bread on the table of showbread. But here you go. This meal off very fine flour, this is speaking of the humanity of Jesus Christ. This is his, his person. Why would there be no yeast in this? 
because there's no sin in the Savior. So the men who were in Men of Steel the last time we met, uh, Byron took us through that thing about him being sinless. There was no sin found in him. There was no acts of sin. And we took us through a bunch of passages that morning explaining that there's no sin, so no leaven. How about honey? Isn't that kind of odd? Why would you even think of putting honey, and why would you specify there should be no sweetness in that? Because Jesus wasn't a real sweet guy. Honey is a picture of what, it's the reverse of sin side of us. It is the human good, is the best way I can describe it. It is human effort to do, in our view, good things. That Jesus Christ didn't do what he did out of the strength of the good, the ability of us to do, at least in our view, is good stuff. Because, you know, people that are not saved, even some people that are criminals that are, do terrible things in their life are capable of doing things, you know, of caring for a child or, a child or loving a spouse or, you know, those kinds of things. That's the human good. And there is none in the Savior that was part of his the offering. He was free from that portion of, of our no human effort in that. And the things that are included are pure olive oil, which usually speaks of how was he empowered to do the ministry? The spirit. The spirit that descended like a dove, you know, the symbolic and it was the Spirit of God that empowered him, enabled him in his human flesh to do what he did. So here's a picture of that that is there. And salt. Well, we got salt, you know, okay, be salt of the earth, and there's that influence, so that's possibility. There's another thing that salt, to these people in particular, meant a big deal. It cured, so that's a little bit, that was part of it. There's even a, there's another one that's really, really important, especially when you come to the temple and the chosen people. How do you seal a covenant? By exchanging salt. A covenant of salt. This will be a covenant of salt to you. Preservation. So, what's that? Preservation. Preservation is part of it, but I think it's really speaking in his flesh, he fulfills the covenant. He is able to completely do everything required to fulfill that covenant that we, or the Jewish nation, the human beings, weren't able to do because he had everything in his humanity here able to do it. And that is completely dedicated to God with the exception when the priest offered this, it all got burned. When the average Jewish person came in, their portion, a portion of that would be offered and burnt, and the remainder would go to the priest, and they would be eaten by the Levitical priesthoods in the court, within that court. And so, it's a, I think it's a a picture of a little bit of our offerings to him are enjoyed by the by our high priest as well. So there's a he has a role, an intermediary role for us. So so that's a kind of a picture that there's this priest that's an intermediary for the people, but the priest himself, it's all given to God. And Christ gave himself all for us, and yet he is our we have one God and one mediator, the Lord Christ Jesus, so the one in between. So we're moving along from one to two. These are, in, when we go back into Chronicles, you're going to find they did all of these, but in reverse order. Then there's this peace offering, which is kind of a different one. The peace offering was any animal, male or female, without defect, always had to be perfect, it is a voluntary act of worship and thanksgiving, and it often included a communal meal. If you'll remember when the whole Samuel series started, and we had a young woman who wanted a child, 
and it talked about how the family went down to the temple and they made that offering and they had the feast afterwards. And she skipped it for a year or two until she took down Samuel to dedicate it. Remember that? That's been ages ago when we started this whole series. But they had that meal. This is the one where they went down and they made this offering. And the God's portion of that was the, the fat portions and let's see what I did it all here. The fat covering and the inner parts, the fat tail, the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver. Those parts of the insides, those were all put on the altar and burned. And then the breast was given to the high priest. It's called a wave offering. It was given to the high priest. He would wave it, and then the priest's family would eat that. And the right, let's say hindquarters is what I'm thinking, was given to the officiating priest. So all of the priests got to have the breast. The one who did the job got to have that one quarter. And that went to them, to his family. It's called a heave offering. I don't know whether they had to heave it up. I don't understand that part. So they would share that with the priesthood. And then the poor people giving it, the remainder could be enjoyed. Uh, it's called the Thanksgiving offering for the remainder to be eaten the same day. Uh, for the priest and all that, and for the vow or free will offering, it had to be eaten within two days, and anything left over on the third day got burned up. So you had two days to do it. Being a peace offering is starting to talk about fellowship. Because what's happened between us and God because of the sacrifice that was made? broken down that wall, that barrier between us and created peace between us and God. And now because of that you can have fellowship and it talks about feeding on the lamb or the or that we feed on Christ and we have fellowship and there's that peace is, and so now they eat this offering together. It's like, you know, Christ in us and we feed on the word, we feed on him. It's this illustration of this relationship now that we all can join in together and he is in us in a way. So that's picturing looking ahead and saying here's what peace with God means and uh, we now have this opportunity <coughs> for fellowship with one another and for this connection to him. So we've got burnt offering, grain offering, peace offering. We're down to number four, the sin offering. This is the one that we saw right here. It says, he rose early and brought him down. They brought in seven bulls, rams, and lambs, and male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and Judah. And so they offered them all on the altar. And the interesting thing I want you to see is they, oh, let's read through it. So they slaughtered the bulls in verse 22, and the priest took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar, and they also slaughtered the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar, and they slaughtered the lambs also and sprinkled the blood on the altar. And they brought the male goats of the sin offering before the king in the assembly, and they laid their hands on them. And the priests slaughtered them and purged the altar with their blood to atone for all Israel. For the king ordered the burnt offering and the sin offering for all Israel. So this sin offering is really important. And if you recall, I said this is your step. When you come to God, this one comes first. The burnt offering up here follows this one. Yeah? I don't understand. It says um, number four... Uh, the special feature of this offering is the whole bullock being burnt upon the ground outside the camp. Yeah. So we have two altars? No, there's no altar out there. They take it out to the place where the ashes are poured out, where they pack the ashes from the brazen altar out, and they empty the ashes, and they're taken outside of the city. It's a clean place, but it's outside of the city where those ashes are burned, and they build a big bonfire out there with wood, and they burn the sacrifice out there. 
with except a little portion of it is on the altar, but uh, but the rest of it is offered outside. And there's a reason for that. First of all, it's the sin offering. This is the offering for sin, and it's different from this one. This is what you did. Does that make sense? This is the trespass where you missed the mark, where you where you where you actually you violated God's rules or his order. You messed up and you had a personal sin where you got mad, blew your top, did something that God says not to do. That's this one. This one here you got from Adam. Not Pastor Adam. <laughs> He got it the same place we all did from our father, Adam. This is the sin that is in us. Where it says, you know, in sin I was conceivable. There it is, right there. That's what this one's for. And when Christ paid the price for this one, where did it take place? Was it uh, in the city? Was it up by the altar? Was it? It was outside of the city on the hill of Golgotha, and on that hill, his physical body was nailed to that cross. And then it says that he bore something for us, which is what the wrath of God for our sin. And he bore hell for us. And hell cannot be in the presence of God in any way, shape, or form, and that's sin. Um, and so he's taken outside of the city, out of the. And he bore that stuff out and away from the presence of God. This is kind of the beginning of the tithe. Of the tithe? Um, number five. Number five is. It's a little different than that. It's kind of a similar idea, but it's a little bit different than that. And yeah, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's the kind of loosely related, I guess, in the percentage. But, but this one is uh, it's it's mandatory. It has to happen. And this is the one that it's part of that once in the year atonement that's made when the priest went in and sprinkled that blood on the Holy of Holies which covered them. All the other sacrifices that were made for the whole year after that. And so it has to be done every year. Um, and it talks about the... If I can get all these my notes in order here. Uh, the young bull was for a high priest and the whole congregation. And the blood for that was sprinkled in front of the veil and put on the horns of the altar of incense. So when you see in Hezekiah, they said, take the bull. The first thing was the bull, and he did it seven times. Seven speaking of God's doing. It's a reminder that God's the one that's really doing the doing. The end bull was for the high priest and the whole congregation. The blood sprinkled in front of the veil and put on the horns of the altar of incense. The male goat was for the leader, and the blood was to be put on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. The female goat or the lamb for the common person, and the blood was to be put on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. And a dove or pigeon for the poor, the blood was to be put on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering. And for the very poor, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour for the very poor. And it was all burnt on the altar. It is... Uh, for unintentional, it's not, it, it's for the fact that you're a sinner, not from specific things that you recognize that you have done, if that makes sense. So cleansing from defilement. And uh, there was, for the high priest, and when they did that bullock, uh, none of them, it all was burnt outside the camp where the ashes were pot, so it's all consumed. The ones for the atonement for others uh, could be eaten by the high priest 
inside the court. So the, the priests would use that for their food, but it was inside, within the court of the tabernacle. So it happens in there. As, again, you got that mediator role between God and God. We're just a bit out of time. We've got time to get the trespass offering. This is the one when you realize you just did a boo boo. And the 20% thing was a fine for if it was a monetary one where you, the restitution was needed to be made. For example, if you stole something from someone or you caused harm to someone and you wrecked their Maserati when you had it borrowed, you had to pay back their Maserati plus 20%. And actually, you were expected to make payment to them, payment to the temple, plus the 20%. So it's double plus, if I understand it right. But you would come and you would make this offering, and it was a ram that would be offered. And it was required for sin, requiring restitution, for cleansing from defilement, and you had to pay the fine if it was something that could be measured as a financial against someone or a theft or whatever. And then they would take the gift, the fat portions and the fat tail kidneys low over the liver and all the remainder had to be eaten by the priests within the court of the tabernacle. So that, you can see this also fed the families of the priests within the courts. But the, it's interesting that the portions why are those portions offered to God? Why the fat? And why the liver? And why those kidneys? You go, that's weird. What do we tell people that God wants? Yes, He wants your body, but He wants heart. your heart. We call it heart. It's a pump. This part. When you were an ancient Jew, did you talk about the heart? You talked about the what of compassion. The bowels of compassion. It was that part that was seen as the inner part of man. That was what God wants. And that's the part of the offering that He got. Was that part of you that was the real you, not the physical body, if you get it. And that's, and that's what's offered to Him. Is the real person. We are way out of time, but I hope this, you can take that home, read it, follow those verses, go back, read Leviticus, and then you can understand what it was that Hezekiah did for the nation when he brought them back and had these sacrifices that morning in the temple. Yes? Tables. Thank you. Joanna said she would remind me. Uh, we have potluck afterwards, so some of the guys can go back and help set up when we're done here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Father, we thank you for our time this morning, for being able to go into your word and, and try to understand what was taking place this, in Hezekiah's life on this day. As they met out on that empty place and began to look at the huge job that they had, and these offerings that were made that we have so much trouble identifying with, help us to see that it pointed to not only the need, but the coming of the one who would fulfill them for your son, Jesus Christ, who we look back at and look back to the cross and recognize uh, his sacrifice, his total obedience to you, and his offering of himself uh, to you to fulfill your will, and also to carry the weight of our sin and to carry the punishment and the penalty for our sin that now we have full access to you. And Father, as we look back on that day and remember the day that that veil that separated the holy place where God was was rent from top to bottom, that the access into God was made possible for us, that that's that veil that kept them back, Father, is now open. The place that they could not go because they needed that intermediator. We have in Christ the one who goes to the Father for us. And we have access in Him to the very throne of grace. We thank you, Father, for that. and give you praise this morning in Jesus' name.